Thank you, songsters. Good morning to everybody as we worship here this morning at Cardiff Canton. Welcome to those who are watching later on YouTube. We're going to continue our worship now by singing together, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Let's stand, please, and sing all the verses. Let's take our seats. Do you still get lots of amazing offers through your letterbox, junk mail, or in your email inbox? You know this sort of thing. Dear Mr Woodman, here is some great news. Today our computer has selected you to be entered into our prize winning draw. Yes, Mr Woodman, act now and our free gift of £15,000 could be yours. When we get a letter like that, 
Perhaps we, we got so used to getting them that we just throw them in the bin. We're quite right to be suspicious in this world. Free gifts like £15,000 aren't that common. But many people have grown so sceptical about free gifts, so sceptical that when God says he loves us even despite all we have done wrong, even despite all our many faults, we don't believe him. So sceptical that when God says that he wants us to experience life in all its fullness, more than just a humdrum existence, we don't believe him. So sceptical that when God says he wants us to share and enjoy all the riches which Christ himself has inherited, we don't believe him. The world has hardened us to the point where we have become so sceptical, so cynical, that despite God's clear offer to us, we assume there must be a catch. We're not good enough or not holy, holy enough. We're not sincere enough to get the really good things from God. But the Bible is clear. God's offer of a free gift is unmistakable. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what you are, writes John in his letter. And Paul writes, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. We belong to God. We are part of God's family. We are citizens in God's kingdom. And that is a fact before anything we do. We don't have to earn the right. We just have to accept the right and turn to him. We're going to sing King of Kings, Majesty. And as we do so, the, these words remind us that this is something that God does for us. In royal robes, I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty, we sing in the, the, the refrain. So let's sing together now, please.
and loving Heavenly Father, as we sing those words, perhaps we remember the story that Jesus told about the prodigal son. Perhaps it should be called the forgiving father. And we think about that son who ran away with his dad's inheritance, squandered it all, came to his senses. And when he returned, the father was there waiting eagerly, running to meet him with outstretched arms. And we recognize, Father, in that story, your love for us. And just as the Father put on a banquet and found the finest robe for his son, your love for us is like that. No matter who we are, what we have done, we belong to you and your family. We are citizens in your kingdom. Lord, in a world which is disconnected, where many people feel alone and disenfranchised, we thank you that there is a place for every single one of them at your table. And we pray, Lord, that the way that we live, the things that we say and do, will help others to discover their place at your table. Where people are feeling lonely, Lord, or, or grieving, or lost, may they somehow recognize your arms of love you're running to meet them, perhaps in the things that we say and do. We pray for a world which is lost in so many ways just now. Again, Lord, we pray about the, the war in Ukraine, that you will work in people's hearts and minds and bring peace And we pray, Lord, for our country, that you will work in the minds of the leaders, uh, those people, Lord, who are, who are, who are um, negotiating about pay conditions and, and uh, all, all of those issues that are so troubling for people at this time. We pray, Lord, that you will give the leaders wisdom and you will give everyone compassion those in our fellowship who are grieving just now, Lord, we pray for them, that they will know your arms of love surrounding them. And as we worship you this morning, Lord, come into our presence, be, be with us, challenge us and change us. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We're going to listen to the singing company now, and then after that, Christine is going to bring for us the young people's focus.
young people for um, that message. I'd like you to come back now. All those that ran away, come back. And any other young people here who are still in school, I'd like you to come and help me, please. Stand in a nice line because we're going to find out a little bit more about you. This is called the YP focus, the young people's focus. And sometimes we don't know much about our young people, do we? So I'm going to ask you some questions. They're, they're not difficult questions. Don't be scared, all right? Firstly, I'm going to ask you how old, your name and how old you are, okay? Right, here we go. Tom, I'm six, Tom and I'm 16. Isabel and I'm 11. Beth and I'm 8. Caitlin, I'm 17. Ava, I'm 6. Jonah, I'm 7. Ezekiel, I'm 10. Okay, now the next question is, what is your favourite thing at school? Okay. Ready? <laughs> Here we go. Uh, technology. Math. Chemistry. Working. Science. IT. There we are. Did we hear that? Right. Now, what is your, what do you like to do when you're not in school? A hobby or something like that? Okay. Uh, cycle. Cycle. Play with my dog. Just relax. Play on the piano. Colouring. Football. Playing the guitar. There we are. Did you know that? Ezekiel plays the guitar. Now then, you might not know this, but what would you like to be when you're older? You might not have decided. That's fine. What, what do you think you would like to be when you are older? Um, engineer. A teacher. A um, teacher. A doctor. Teacher. Drum player. Teacher. Ooh, lots of teachers. Good. Good. <laughs> now then, young people, do you think God can use you now? Or do you think you've got to wait until you're a teacher or an engineer or a doctor? What do you think? Not sure? God can use you now. God has just used some of you when you stood here and sang to us and you blessed us all with your lovely singing. You don't have to wait until you're a grown-up for God to use you. There's a chorus, there's a song that um, John Gowans wrote and the chorus says, in the service of Jesus there's a place for all if we're towering giants or just kind of small. If you've been up to college or you don't know much yet because you're still at school, if you're childlike, you're welcome, for the book says of such that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So it's telling us we need to be more like you. Rather than you wait until you're grown up, if our heart's all right, then we'll do. We're going to stand and sing that song. Um, you don't have to be clever. And let, thank you, young people, for your help. And before you go, there's something for you. Let's stand and sing.
wonderful words, so simple yet so sublime. You'll do, you'll do. God cares about every one of us and has something for us to do, something for us to contribute to the world around us. I, I, th I think that Christine asked the children what their favourite thing was at school. And I noticed that all the children answered with a subject that they liked studying. How studious of them. When Christine asked them, I thought, oh, school dinners. <laughs> oh, oh, you two, you, yeah, Neil and Kat as well. So, so, I, so I've learned something from the children this morning. I need to be more studious. So thank you very much for that. Right, we're going to listen to the announcements now from Chris and then take up the offering, please. Good morning, and here are the announcements for this week. We say, we say first of all, thank you to Colin Maunder for the lovely flowers at the front of our hall. And just a reminder, there are still spaces on the flower rotor. If you wish to contribute flowers on a Sunday morning, there's a list on the, uh, the wall in the corridor. Uh, please fill your name in there to take part in this very valuable service to the core. Today, after the meeting, there will be our tea and coffee fellowship, as usual, in this meeting, and our young people We'll be meeting at 11.30 in the rear hall. On Wednesday, we have our walk-in warm space between 11 and 2. Um, of course, everybody's welcome to come and join us for tea and coffee and some fellowship. And there are further details of developments of this, uh, this walk-in warm, warm space uh, that feature in the Let's Connect. So please have a look in the Let's Connect, Let's Connect about that time. At 7.30 on Wednesday evening, there is a meeting of the core council, just to remind you. And next Sunday, we meet again here at 10 a.m. for worship, and our leader will be Major David. Looking a little further ahead, the weekend of the 4th and 5th of February is our YP annual weekend, and we have a special guest for that weekend, David Williamson. In core family news, we have been uh, remembering a number of our folk in hospital over the last few weeks, and we are very thankful that um, most of them have come home. However, Major Reg Bat still is in St. David's, so we continue to pray for him. And our prayers also continue for those who have recently been bereaved. We think of Neil, the loss of his father, and we think of Pam and Angela with the loss of their, their sister, Caroline. Um, thank you for your attention this morning, and now we will take up the offering. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that you are ever present in our lives. We thank you that no matter where we go, we are always able to contact you. You are only ever one prayer away. Now, Lord, as we thank you for your love and your care, we pray that as we offer these small gifts back to you, that you will accept and bless them. We ask that they will be multiplied and that through the wise use of this money, others will be drawn into your kingdom Amen. 
Our scripture reading is taken from Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 and the first six verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Amen. Let's listen please to the songsters.
Thank you, songsters. Now it's a turn for us all again to sing together. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. Let's stand, please, and sing all the verses. And now we'll listen to the band, please.
Thank you, Ben, for that uh, lovely rendition and reminder of those words, that truth, thou will keep him, him, her, anyone, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on God. Perfect peace, God's peace, God's shalom, not a peace which is just merely an absence of noise or, or, or strife, but peace which is about a wholeness, a, a being in the place we were designed to be, being in God's family, part of God's kingdom. Here outlined in this letter to the Ephesians is news about God's gift of inheritance to the world. Many people in this world don't give news like this a second look because it is, it seems, too good to be true. But here in Ephesians, God promises that we can be members of his family. At the baptism of Jesus, people thought that they heard God declare, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Later on, there is a story about the family of Jesus coming to look for him. Your mother and brothers are here, he was told. And Jesus said, those who hear God's word and put it into practice are my mothers and brothers. And today Jesus says the same to us. You are my brothers, my sisters, my mothers. This is the gift alluded to in Ephesians, the gift of belonging to God's family. And it really is a free gift. There is nothing we can do to earn it or deserve it. We don't have to work for it or enter any contest or win the lottery. We don't have to earn our spiritual inheritance. We don't have to work hard for it. You don't have to be clever or be good or be deserving. When we were born into God's family, we were made into God's children. There is a lovely image in the book of Ezekiel where Ezekiel pictures God's people, Jerusalem, as a child born that nobody wants, just left in a field. And God says through Ezekiel, nobody cut your cord, nobody rubbed you in salt because apparently that was what they did when they were caring for a baby that was born in those days, they would rub them in salt. Nobody did that for you. But I passed by, God passed by, and he picked up his people and cared for them and loved them. They didn't earn his love. And that image is an image which is appropriate for us too. When we were born into God's family, we were made into God's children, rubbed in salt, sanctified, made holy. That's what Paul is writing about in these first few verses of Ephesians. Paul calls it being in Christ. But if we are to enjoy life in all its fullness, then we need to know that being in Christ makes a person who might otherwise have felt unworthy, worthy. We need to know that being in Christ makes a person who might otherwise have felt weak, powerful. We need to know that being in Christ makes the person who might otherwise have felt sinful holy. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. We need to know that we are in Christ and that God has given us that inheritance. When we know what God has done for us by allowing us to be in Christ, then we will be truly free. Let's take a closer look at these words. Ephesians is addressed to God's holy people. Some versions, some English versions of uh, the, the passage say God's saints. In the New Testament, Christians are commonly referred to as saints. And we've, we've thought about this before. The Greek word used sounds like hagios, which literally means holy. To be a saint in the New Testament sense of the word is to be a holy one. And that's who we are. 
in Christ. Don't be misled by the idea that sainthood is something which can only be conferred upon certain dead people by the church. According to God's word, if you have chosen to follow God, then you are already saints. God has done everything that is needful. He has picked you up. He has rubbed you in salt. He has cut the cord and made you one of his own. According to God's word, if you have chosen to follow God, then you are already saints. You are a saint not because of what you do for God, but because of what Christ did for you. We are not holy because of our own good works or righteousness. We are holy because God loves us, Jesus died for us, and God has chosen us. When a person gives control of their lives to Christ, there is a sense in which they share their reputation with Christ. Christians automatically become God's representatives or ambassadors. And as God's ambassadors, people who want to hold God accountable will sometimes challenge us. And occasionally we get to enjoy some of the positive aspects of being his representatives, his ambassadors too. One of the things which I always notice when I'm out uh, on behalf of the Salvation Army, Christmas caroling or collecting money, uh, is how often people say to me, you do such good work. Of course, they don't mean me personally, they mean the Salvation Army. Many, many years ago, before becoming an officer, I went down to Trafalgar Square in London to see the New Year in. I was in Salvation Army uniform, and at the stroke of midnight, I got kisses from lots of girls. It was really, I should, I should go more often, really. I thought it was because I was handsome and sophisticated and charming. But no, it was all because I was representing the Salvation Army. When people look at me wearing the uniform, they don't see me with all my faults. They see me as a representative of the Salvation Army. And I hope that when people look at the Salvation Army, they see a body of people that reflects Christ. They see people who are representatives of God's kingdom. They don't see us with all our faults, because we are in Christ. Somehow or another, Christ's identity has become ours. In Christ, we are holy. In Christ, we have significance. But we need to know that fact in order to start living our lives as God intends. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's only when we know we are saints because God sees us in Christ that we can really start to be who we are, what we are. This letter to the Ephesians was probably a circular in its original form, intended to be read by all the churches. It's just that the copy sent to the Ephesians was the one that found its way into our Bibles. The, the main reason that scholars think that is because the, the letter is addressed to people that the writer doesn't seem to, to know that well. He writes, I have heard about your good works, and yet from all that we can piece together about Paul's life, Paul knew the Ephesians really well, and so for that reason we think that it was a general uh, circular, and the, the bit to Ephesians would have just been um, added on, where, depending on which church it was being read at, which church had received it to read it. And so that's one of the, the views of scholars. Some scholars have noted that its style is actually less like a letter and more like an ancient kind of Greek rhetorical speech that was designed to encourage. We think that probably all of Paul's letters would have been read out loud anyway, so that probably doesn't make that much of a difference to our uh, reading of it today. As an encouragement to these early Christians, it affirms that they are significant in Christ. They represent God himself and belong to his family. They share in Christ's inheritance. But this speech or letter goes further. Verse 3 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Those who are in Christ aren't just blessed. God has given us everything we could possibly need, every spiritual blessing. But if you don't realise that in Christ God gives you everything you need, then how will you know to rely on him? Wouldn't it be great if somebody made an anonymous and secret deposit into your bank account? If you didn't know about the existence of that deposit, though, you would never be able to draw upon it. But when you come into the knowledge of that truth, then you would immediately have access to all the money. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is precisely what the word of God is saying to us. You may choose not to believe it and live in spiritual poverty or you may choose to draw upon your resources in Christ. Sometimes we can feel that we don't have what it takes to do what God is calling us to do. But in Christ, you are already sufficient for everything he calls you to do. In Christ, you are significant. In Christ, you are sufficient. But these words to Christians also reassure that things will stay that way because none of the riches of being in Christ depend on how well we do. There is no probationary period for being a Christian. It, it's not as if after so many months or years, if we've not done very well, God will say, well, actually, you, I, I don't want you anymore. When we are in Christ, we stay that way. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can take away the inheritance which is ours. Nothing can rob us of our eternal place in heaven with God the Father. We are in Christ because God chose us. We are in Christ because God adopted us. We are in Christ because God freely gives us his grace. In Christ we are secure because we belong to God. Good parents never give up on their children no matter what. Like the most perfect father you could imagine, God loves his children however they turn out. When they come back full of remorse, God's running to meet them with arms outstretched. Our security has nothing to do with us being good or clever or charming. If you feel that you've reached your peak and it's going to be downhill from here on, then fear not. God won't abandon you. God chose you. He called you and adopted you as his child. These opening verses to the Ephesians are just overflowing with good news. In Christ, you are significant. In Christ, you are sufficient. In Christ, you are secure. You are a saint, so learn to recognize your significance. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing, so learn to rely on God's sufficiency. You are accepted, so learn to rest in God's security. You are somebody because Christ lives in you. In Christ, you have all you will ever need. And in Christ, you are secure. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Let's turn to our closing song. It's number 66 in the Salvation Army songbook. This is my father's world. Let's stand, please, and sing the verses through.
And so, Father God, we thank you that we can sing those words about this world being my Father's world. Thank you that because of Christ, we can call you Father. And we have that kind of relationship with you. And bless us, Lord, as we seek to reflect your glory, as we take our responsibility as your children seriously. Help us to be people who share your love and your goodness with all around us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus who died for us and who rose again. Amen.